Uh, our LockNote presenter is Cathy Reid. Cathy is a longtime friend and former president of Linux Australia and participant in LCA's past. Cathy works at the intersection of open source, emerging technologies, and the technical community, communities who shape and are shaped by them. Cathy will be speaking about communities are systems. What can systems thinking teach us about creating, curating, and concluding communities? I shall now hand over to Cathy. So as Miles mentioned, I'm currently a PhD candidate at the School of Cybernetics at the Australian National University, where I'm investigating voice data used in machine learning and its implications for systems that use language technologies like voice assistants and smart speakers. So I have a strong interest in computing systems and the people who use them or are used by them. And before I start the talk proper today, there are three things that I'd like to do. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting today from the unceded lands of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation here in Geelong, which itself is a Wadawurrung word. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and to leaders emerging. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge that Linux ConfAU is a community produced event. And I'd like to recognize the organizers and volunteers for their time and their labor Without you, this conference and the benefits it yields, like connections across communities and the spread of new ideas and techniques, wouldn't happen as readily. So thank you. Finally, I want to acknowledge the toll that the last two years has taken on everyone. Since I last saw many of you on the Gold Coast, back in the before times of early 2020, many of us have been through lengthy lockdowns, and dealt with the background anxiety of case numbers, testing shortages, and upended economies, labour markets, and supply chains. So I want to say thank you for choosing to be here at an online event delivered over video. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to the time when we can all see each other again, alive, well, and in person. So thank you for locking down, for wearing masks, for homeschooling, for isolating, for testing, for getting vaccinated, because those actions don't just help keep us safe as individuals, they help safeguard us all as a community. And that takes me to the keynote proper. Many of us work with systems in our professional lives. And when we think of systems, we might think of some variant of these. This, the, this is the Guardi supercomputer in Canberra, one of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Or we might think of something like this. That's a photo by Jamie Schmidt of the Dingo car from the Open Hardware Miniconf at LCA 2020. Or when we think of systems, we might think of something like this. That's a slide of the ARPANET topology, the predecessor to today's internet circa about 1976 probably fewer nodes than uh, some of us have on our home networks today. So when we think of systems, we tend to think of computing systems, cyber physical systems. They can be as simple and as small as a single LED with a power source, or at the other extreme of scale, have millions of intangible and physical components interconnected through different networking protocols, running myriad pieces of intertwined and interdependent software all across the globe. These systems can be orchestrated, deliberately and carefully planned and designed, or as we all know, they can grow organically as box after box is provisioned for some prototype or pilot project that never seems to be entirely decommissioned. Over time, these systems can grow in complexity, intertangled, intertwined, until no one person can really know the whole picture. They can exist for a brief period of time. How many containers have you spun up and down today? Or for much longer? Do we have any COBOL programmers in the house? Then at their end of life, they are disassembled, disaggregated and decommissioned and hopefully recycled. So many of us are conversant and comfortable thinking about computing and networking infrastructure as systems and systems of systems that have life cycles and connections and components and characteristics. But at their most fundamental, 
systems are simply defined as a set of elements in mutual interaction. And we can apply systems thinking to many different fields. In his groundbreaking work on general systems theory, published in 1968, this chap, Ludwig von Burton Lanfey, set out principles for systems that apply to fields as diverse as biology, chemistry, ecology, and sociology. You might have heard of some of these principles before hierarchy, entropy, complexity. Von Burton Lanfey held the view that the world itself was an organization comprised of many different systems interacting and influencing each other. And he held the view that by thinking about systems, we would have better tools to explore, explain and predict various phenomena. So systems and systems thinking is widely applicable. And in fact, communities like these, the excellent volunteers at LCA 2016 in Geelong, communities like these, the incredible volunteer team at LCA 2012 in Ballarat, communities like these, I believe that's the UnPDNS in Perth in 2014, communities like these, that's the 20,000, uh, that's the 2008 Melbourne Penguin Dinner at the Bazaar, the Night Market, and communities like these, our fabulous LCA Christchurch 2019 volunteers, all of these communities and the community that you're a part of today by attending this conference online can be considered as systems too. So the key tenet of my talk today is deceptively simple. Communities are systems. Communities are systems. And the concepts we use for thinking about computing systems can also be used for thinking about the communities who develop, use and are affected by them. That is, by approaching the concept of community through the lens of systems thinking, we have a different toolbox, a set of concepts and ways that help us to create, care for and conclude communities. And I don't think I need to make this argument to this audience about how vitally important communities are to computing and to software systems. This entire conference is centered around a set of software designed, developed, distributed, adopted by a community of millions around the world. That software and its world changing impact wouldn't exist without communities. So I'll take that argument as assumed. However, one more nuanced point that I want to make that perhaps isn't so readily evident is that computing systems and community systems are closely coupled. They influence each other. Sometimes when we design computing and cyber physical systems, we view people and communities as distinct or separate elements of those systems. In this view, people or the community provide inputs such as instructions, data, code contributions, configurations, programs, and the computing system provides outputs, reports, calculations, predictions, waves hands. This type of interaction can be thought of as primarily transactional. Inputs go in, the computer, the computer system does some processing or computation, and outputs come out. Another view for anyone who's done soft systems methodology sees communities as a key integral part of an overall system, as one of many interconnected components that make up a technology system, such as hardware, software, documentation, business models, user experience, and so on. This component view based view is primarily transactional. Again, the community is a part a component that provides services or functionality to other parts of the system and in return receives benefits such as easier to use products, peer support and so on. But instead of this transactional approach, when we think about technical systems and communities, I want us to start to think about transformation, not just about inputs or outputs or components that provide services and functions, I want us to think about how by interacting with each other, influencing each other reciprocally and continually 
through design decisions, past dependencies, competing drivers, emerging standards and many other factors, technical systems and people systems, communities, transform each other. Communities shape the computing systems that are built and in turn those systems influence and change the communities they interact with. This view that people and communities shape and are shaped by the systems they interact with is, not surprisingly, called an interactionist view. And it's also the view taken in this book by Batcha Friedman and David G. Hendry called Value Sensitive Design. It's a fantastic read and the overarching takeaway is that technology is imbued with the values of the people who create it. But that's not always a good thing. For example, we have facial recognition technology used in ever increasing contexts and capabilities that doesn't recognize people of color and especially women of color as well as white people. Gender Shades, this work, is the incredible work of Joy Bulamwini, who earlier this week submitted her PhD thesis. So please do congratulate her on Twitter. She's Jovial Joy. And in Gender Shades, she outlines how common facial recognition models just don't work for some people. And there are clear reasons for this. Firstly, we have far fewer women and people of colour working in artificial intelligence to begin with. For example, this report by the team at AI Now in 2009 found that just 18% of authors at conferences in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning, such as NeurIPS, are women. And less than 6% of people in large technical companies, that's fewer than 1 in 16, identify as black or Hispanic. If the people building systems are predominantly white men, then there are a narrower range of values represented in design decisions, in testing. Fewer people to say, will this work for people like me? And we also need to think about the data upon which our systems are built. There are fewer images and photographs of people of colour in the data sets on which facial recognition models are trained. Again, there's less representation from women and communities of colour in these data sets. And we see this also in speech recognition technology that doesn't recognise the speech of black people as well as white people. This, this is the work of Alison Konake and her colleagues at Stanford who investigated cloud automatic speech recognition algorithms showing that the error rate in speech recognition a measure of how well a model recognises what someone is saying is nearly double for black speakers compared to white speakers. And when you think about where the data that is used to train these models comes from, mobile phones, voice assistants, generally expensive pieces of technology, then we start to see how communities who can afford technology, communities who use that technology, shape how that community is built for everyone even when not everyone is part of that community. But wait, there's more. Big data has become big business, and many of us will be familiar with the work of Shoshana Zuboff and her concept of surveillance capitalism, in which reality, our everyday interactions with data platforms are commodified, extracted, and sold to the highest bidder. And we see how technical platforms exploit that, encouraging us to interact, to post, to engage. We doom scroll while unseen bots harvest our every click and use every like to better target advertising to us because that's the way the system was designed. And by creating a technical system that values popularity and impressions to drive more engagement and to collect more data about us, we feel inadequate if we don't get enough likes or hearts or karma or followers. Community and technology systems shape each other. And if you thought surveillance capitalism was just for giants like Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, try logging onto iView, the streaming site of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, our public taxpayer-funded broadcaster. 
By mandating that viewers must log into iView and then sharing or selling, we're not quite sure because the ABC won't tell us, sharing or selling that viewer data with Facebook and Google by default until the viewer explicitly opts out, our very own auntie is now a surveillance capitalist. Again, technology systems shape communities. If you or your kids watch lots of Bluey, will you only ever be recommended similar content, diminishing the agency you have to choose what you consume? Speaking of privacy and intelligence, sorry, speaking of privacy and surveillance capitalism, we also have doorbells that infringe the privacy of neighbours by listening and watching constantly, <laughs> or at least when US East 1 is up. With the surveillance covering an area greater than just that belonging to the owner of the device. And we've frequently seen uh, requests from law enforcement to have access to this data. So data surveillance used by an individual or household being used to police the community in which that household is situated. That is, the technical system's reach is increased beyond the individual purchaser to the broader community. And here in this article on Gizmodo, we see how at least one of those neighbours is reacting, responding to this technical system by having it ruled illegal. Technology systems shape communities and community reaction. And speaking of things that have been ruled illegal, we have governments who tried to match income and social benefit databases poorly and unlawfully, issuing debt notices to people who could least afford to pay. And I think that hints at the values of the government that created that system. On the flip side, we also have a community which fought and campaigned and advocated and launched legal action and eventually got robo-debt overturned. People like Asha Wolf and Lindsay Jackson, who I think is speaking tomorrow, and several others. Communities do have agency to shape technical systems. There are also incredible examples of technical systems imbued with exemplary community focused values. I suspect many of us have used Matt Hayward's find a rat site in recent days. It's not perfect. Crowdsource data never is, but it's leveraged the power of the community to provide a much needed scarce resource for all of those who aren't mates with the CEO of Chemist Warehouse. And many of us are familiar with the work of Chris Fryer and John Oxer in creating accessibly controlled wheelchairs that aim to give more freedom and independence and agency to wheelchair users. Communities and their values help shape technical systems. So if we take the view that communities, social systems, influence how technical systems are designed, developed, directed and deployed, and in turn technical systems shape communities, then it's not too far of a leap for me to argue that thinking about communities as systems is vitally important. If we shape communities for the better, we might just shape technical systems for the better and in turn build better communities and so on in a positive feedback loop. So today I'm going to outline some principles from systems thinking and apply these principles to open source communities. What we're going to uncover is not necessarily novel or groundbreaking, but my intent here is to present it through an unexpected lens that of connected, complicated, co-evolving systems. And through this framing, I want to encourage all of us to reflect on the suggestion that every commit Every design decision, every choice is part of shaping and reshaping both communities and technical systems. And that we as individuals have some agency and power to determine what that shape might be. So what can systems thinking teach us about creating communities? And to start with, I'm going to explore the work of these folks. Russell Ackhoff on the left there and Fred Emery on the right. Fred Emery was an Australian psychologist. And for any psychology people watching, his work was particularly influential in the area of organisational development. And Russell Ackhoff was world renowned for his expertise in management science and operations research. 
1976, Emery and Akoff authored this book, this book, on purposeful systems. In it, they explain human behaviour as a system of purposeful events, and their intent in outlining this view was to help us understand how to build not just better social systems, but how to understand social systems so that we can build better social systems that had machines in them, technical and cyber-physical systems. And so in this book, Emery and Akoff cover many different types of systems, but a key takeaway is that many systems are purposeful or goal-seeking systems. That is, the system is structured around a particular objective. The system might not have a lot of agency about how it achieves this goal, such as, say, a flower whose goal is to be pollinated by a bee, or alternatively, the actors within a system might have a lot of choice, a lot of agency about how they achieve that goal, that objective. For example, in a game of chess, the goal of the system is to move such a way that your opponent is forced into a position of checkmate. And there are literally millions of ways in which that goal can be achieved. And the implications for communities, people systems, are clear. Communities have purposes. They have objectives and goals. A sporting community exists to participate and further the adoption of a particular sport. An academic community exists to further the body of knowledge around a particular topic. The Linux Australia community, oh hi, has the purpose, the objective of fostering open source software, open hardware, open data, open content and open culture throughout Australia and the broader region. There are many ways in which this could be achieved, but typically the choice that the community has made has been to achieve this through Linux user groups and by all meeting face to face once a year and wearing the t-shirt to prove it. Values are also important here because the behavior used to achieve goals is an expression of the values of the community and the people in it. For example, the Linux ConfAU community could choose to write manifestos and flame various mailing lists or choose to partner productively, constructively with other organizations, other systems to achieve shared goals. So in creating communities, we need to be very clear about the goals that the community should seek and importantly, the values and the choices that will be made in pursuit of those goals. We have choice and agency about how and how not we pursue our goals. Another concept from systems thinking that is useful when we're creating communities is that of boundaries. That is, where does a system begin and end? What elements are considered inside or outside of a system? Where is that line drawn? And what might need to happen for the boundary to be permeated, to be crossed? That is, how easy is it for new elements to enter or to leave the system? And one of the key thinkers around boundaries is this chap, Gerald Midgley, who's written several books on systems and intervening in systems. But I've highlighted one of his most famous books here. Here, It's called uh, Systemic Intervention. And in this book, he makes the case for a technique he calls boundary critique. I won't go into the details here, they're a little bit esoteric, but in essence he argues that we need to critically evaluate where the boundaries of systems are and where different interpretations of boundaries might conflict. There are several questions he recommends that we ask of systems and of system boundaries so that we identify where those boundaries are and where they could be, such as who are the decision makers in a system, who is affected by a system, that is, where does power lie within a system? And what mechanisms are there for people within a system to express their choice and their agency? And the key point that I want to make here is that boundaries and barriers around a community may not be what we think they are. For example, we have a newcomer session for Linux ConfAU and a huge shout out to everyone who attended last night. And this provides an introduction on what to expect, the lingo, the lay of the land, it helps to make newcomers feel welcome. LCA and PyCon AU both have equity and diversity programs to help with the cost of attendance, again, reducing barriers to participation. 
standards and norms of behaviour such as the code of conduct exist and are explained and generally upheld, helping to reduce concerns people may have about attending. But I want you to consider this example. Imagine that you want to attend a watch party for an awesome conference and that the watch party is on a university campus. Imagine now that you use a wheelchair and thanks to ride sharing companies establishing in your city, there is one wheelchair accessible taxi available for the whole of your city. Thanks, technical systems. You persist, you choose, use agency to book the taxi in advance and they surprisingly show up on time. But when they take you to the university campus, they can't actually drop you off close to the building because the university has tried to discourage parking near buildings. Here we hit another system. So they drop you off about 800 metres from where you need to be on a 30 degree plus day. Thank goodness the watch party's on the ground floor and there are accessible toilets in the building. My point is this. Sometimes we don't know what the barriers are to entering and fully participating in our community. We don't know what those boundaries really are. There is boundary conflict because of the variety of needs in our community. So to build better communities, we need to get better at identifying where those hidden boundaries lie. So we've explored how system thinking principles like purposeful systems and agency and choice can be useful for creating communities, but how might systems thinking help us to curate and care for an existing community? And here I want to draw on the work of Danella Meadows, a very famous systems thinker. This is an excellent book, Thinking in Systems, and it outlines many different ways to intervene and make a change in systems. And I want to focus on one particular concept that Danella Meadows uses, which she refers to as stocks and flows. We're all familiar with the concept of stocks and flows. Think of saying money in and money out of your bank account each month. Money in this case is a stock and where it comes from and where it goes is considered a flow. And you might have stores of this stock such as savings and thinking about finances in communities and keeping communities financially viable is important. But there are many other types of stocks and flows in communities. Consider, for example, volunteer labour. This is a finite resource, a stock, and it can flow in different directions. Flows enter the system when volunteers feel energised and committed and have free time to donate. And that stock of volunteer labour can be consumed in many ways, on productive tasks, on achieving the goals and objectives of the community of the system. Alternatively, they can be squandered and misdirected in dealing with unnecessary conflict and burning out the volunteer, consuming the stock of passion and commitment and time. So to build stronger communities, we need to understand their stocks, their resources, and where they flow in and out and are consumed in the community. Another systems thinking tool that can help us curate communities is that of cardinality and connection. Those of you from a networking or database background will recognise this concept straight away. Cardinality refers to the strength or the bonds of connections between elements in a system. In a database context, it refers to how entities are related. In a network system, it refers to how many paths or edges there are between nodes in a network. And it can be a measure of how tightly a system is connected and how resilient it is to nodes being removed or dropping off the system. The parallels with communities are obvious. If we think about cardinality and connection, we can think about how closely our community is bonded. For example, what would a map of Linux Australia members look like? Hmm. Well, it just so happens that I prepared this map earlier. Bear with me one moment. And it shows some really interesting patterns. And I want to be very clear here that this data is at the postcode level. So there's no actual um, addresses mapped here. 
I only have um, addresses represented in postcode format. So, for example, if you live in 3000, you have a data point in 3000. I, I don't have your actual address. And what this shows as expected are that we have some very dense clusters near urban centres like Melbourne, um, Sydney there, and we have some clusters around cities where there have been um, LCAs and we can see Ballarat there and we can see Geelong. But there are also some unexpected clusters here. So we have a cluster here in aubrey Wodonga, which is quite interesting. And we have a cluster here in northern Tasmania there in Lonnie. And I think I also saw one in Mount Gambia over here. So folks who may not have a local lug or they may not have ways of getting to a local meetup. And so it's harder for these people to make and maintain connections. And so the lessons here are again clear. Sorry. The lessons here are again clear. Understand the connections in your community and what you might be able to do to strengthen them and bring people closer together. One last tool that I'm going to mention for helping to curate communities is that of requisite variety. Remember how we met Russell Ackoff back in the slide about purposeful systems and how systems have goals and how we have agency and choice about how we pursue these goals? Right, well, Ackoff took that concept a step further and thought about how systems use choice and agency to choose how to reach those goals. And he thought about how systems adapted to challenges to those goals, disturbances in the system. And one of the things he found about systems through his research was the more variety the systems had, the greater the range of values and dimensions that the elements in a system took, the more resilient the system was to shocks and to challenges. And again, the implications for communities are clear. The greater the variety of people, the greater the variety of skills they bring to bear, the greater the range of viewpoints and values, the greater the range of resources, the better position the community will be to withstand shocks and unexpected occurrences. And a key example of this that many in the room will be familiar with is from PyCon in the US back in 2020. PyCon was scheduled for just after the COVID-19 pandemic started and they had to cancel. That single event, much like LCA and PyCon AU for Linux Australia, was the key source of revenue for the Python Software Foundation. And they were staring down a loss of over 1 million US dollars. Luckily, donations flowed in to ameliorate and to offset the size of the loss, but it's a good lesson, both for the PSF and for Linux Australia, about the need for requisite variety in revenue. And we also see the need for requisite variety in achieving the goals and objectives of communities. Putting together a conference like LCA requires a wide range of skills, marketing, communication, audiovisual, sponsor liaison, treasury and finance, emceeing and project management. Together, all of us, with our differences, our quirks, our idiosyncrasies, help build rich, resilient communities with our combined superpowers. So we've looked at systems thinking concepts for creating and for curating communities, but how can systems thinking help us in concluding communities? And although requisite variety gives us a tool for thinking about how a system can respond to unexpected shocks, it's less useful for helping us to combat a characteristic of many systems, that of entropy. The concept of entropy has specific meaning in fields such as physics and thermodynamics, but here I'm taking the very broad general definition of entropy to mean the general deterioration and decline of a system. Over time, systems have a tendency to move towards chaos and disorder until they no longer exist. Communities, because they are systems, are similar. They will always need to deal with the constant force of entropy. And when there are large stocks, remember stocks and flows, of resources like volunteer time and clear purpose and objectives and clear ideas about how to achieve those objectives, 
those forces will tend to outweigh the force of entropy. But over time, as those resources are consumed and not replenished, for example, if your volunteers are burnt out or if you don't have the financial revenue to continue operating, then the community will be dealing with entropy. And there will come a time when the community needs to make a very difficult call. How much entropy, how much disorder, how much inactivity is needed before the community can be considered defunct? Or can the entropy be recognised and a decision made to gently end the community in a managed and careful way? So building better communities also means ending communities thoughtfully and carefully. But I don't want to end my talk on that note. Yes, systems decline and decay over time and sometimes the right decision is to gracefully end the community. But remember how systems interact with each other, influence each other? The decline of one community can often sow the seeds of rebirth or birth of another in a pattern of regeneration. Without the Australian Unix Users Group, there would probably be no LCA and no Linux Australia. Without lugs like Love and Slug and Taslug and Humbug, there would be no LCA. And we can choose deliberately what we bring from one community to another because we have agency and we have choice. So in conclusion, my talk today started out with a deceptively simple premise. Communities are systems. And as I've unpacked this concept, we've seen how communities and technical systems shape each other for better and worse. And from this, I've argued that if we build better communities, we will shape better, uh, we will shape better technical systems. And drawing from different authors, I've highlighted several systems thinking concepts, such as purpose and choice, boundaries, cardinality and requisite variety, that provide tools for thinking about and improving communities. And the astute viewer will recognise that along the way, I've created a reading list by stealth, because I sincerely hope to have piqued your intellectual interest. And so on that note, I would like to leave you with one final note to ponder. Communities shape technical systems and technical systems shape communities. Every contribution we make, every code commit, every design decision helps influence the communities we're part of and in turn the technical systems those communities build. And we still have a long way to go. So let's use our choice our agency and all our available tools to actively, deliberately shape our systems because otherwise those systems will shape us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. That was uh, was really interesting. I like the uh, the comment about org. I was thinking, oh, yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, that was really great. Uh, we will hopefully, um, I don't know if we, our minions were able to provide you with the um, live illustration feed possibly. Here we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's incredible. And now we're all dumbstruck looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll hopefully be able to get you a, a hard copy of that. You can um, stick up on oh, your wow. wall or something. Oh, I'd love that. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's great. Um, anyway, so now this is the end of the proceedings for the afternoon. Um, feel free to keep chatting in the channels or do your own thing. We'll be meeting, meeting back here at 9 a.m. for our next keynote from John O'Bacon. You'll probably notice that the other um, stages have disappeared for the moment. They'll be back at 9, don't worry. Um, and I look forward to seeing the keynote with everyone tomorrow. Um, until then, stay safe. <laughs>